Everybody awake? Amen. You're about to be. So we're going to give the Lord some praise and worship tonight because he is good and he is worthy of our praise. Amen. tricky at the end. Yeah. You won't even think you breathe. That's good times. Your happiness, cast your fear 
in the fire cause fear he is a liar let your fire fall and cast down all my fears let your fire fall, your love is all I feel. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel. Cause fear, he is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. simply come longing just to bring something that's worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. The King of endless words no one could express how much you deserve though i'm weak and poor all i have is yours every single breath i'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. 
Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it was all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. It's all about you. It's all about you. Sing it again. I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. Lord, it is all about you tonight. Father, it's all about you all the time. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that, Father, as we get ready for the word to come forth tonight, that, Lord, although we just finished with song, Lord, we're not finished with worship. Lord, let the word always be in worship. And, Father, let it be in humility. Father, where we set ourselves aside and, Lord, where we lift you up. Father, we look at the word when... John said that for him to increase, I must decrease. So, Lord, we ask that, Father, for each one of us today, that, Father, we would just humble ourselves before you at the cross. Lord, and we would listen to your word, and, Father, we would have our lives changed as a result. Father, we pray not only in this sanctuary, but, Lord, we pray for our children's ministry as they get ready to go back there. But, Lord, we also pray for our youth department tonight, that, Lord, whatever they're ministering about tonight, that, Father, that you will be just breaking through those hearts and, Father, setting them on fire. So, Lord, we stand ready and we stand in agreement with your word. So, Father, come and pour yourself out tonight in Jesus' mighty name. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. You're a mighty man of God. Praise and worship team, media team, y'all did an awesome job tonight. Thank y'all. Why don't y'all give them a hand clap? All right, so... How many of you would say that you love me? Love you, Everybody love me? I want you to remember that after tonight. Amen. We're going to be, over the next two weeks, we are going to be dealing with a word. How many of you know that there are words that can be said uh, that people know what you mean without having to say them? In today's world, and especially, and it's right in a lot of areas, uh, but there's a word that I, I hate more than any other word as a pastor, and it's what I call the C word. I hate cancer, and I don't even want to give it full recognition for what it is because I believe that it came from the depths of hell. Can y'all agree with that? I believe that every time I hear, and it's a wonderful hospital, I have absolutely no issues with the hospital, but every time we hear about people going down uh, to Herman down in Houston because of cancer, you know, in my heart, I just believe that the power of God can heal each and every person. And when we make the gospel our source of medication, rather than a pill, uh, wondering whether or not it'll work, how many of you ever been to a doctor and they just throw a medication at you and say, let's try this and see how that works? Anybody? Well, the bad thing about it is they make you a junkie on medication. And a lot of the stuff that you get on, you can't get off. You know, they say, well, you got to be on it for an X amount of time. we got to wean you off. Well, if we knew that, why would we get on it in the first place? But the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, whom the Son sets free is free. How many of you know we need to be, indeed, a lot more freer than what we are? So the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking about the, the one word, that we never really want to talk about here much in church. 
And it's basically the same thing in church as cancer is to the body of a person. But it's called unforgiveness. Unforgiveness will stop you in your tracks from living a life that's productive in the body of Christ. Matter of fact, it is a cancer that will eat away at your life. And when you are dealing with unforgiveness, you get mad at the co-worker, you get mad at the uh, parent, you get mad at the spouse, you get married at your neighbor, or get mad at them. All of a sudden, you get problems, and you just cannot get away from the problem. Listen to me. How many of you have ever dealt with having to sit down with somebody and say, I've got a problem that we need to work out? All of you wives are sitting there shaking your heads. And how do we know that? It's because when you say, we need to talk. Us men, we just rather stab ourselves in the eye with a fork. We don't want to have to sit down and have that conversation. Why? Because it's going to be hurtful, it's going to be painful, and it's going to be long. And it's one of those conversations that you are not allowed to speak. Why? Because at that point in time, whoever is upset, they've got something on their chest that they need to get off. How many of you know that sometimes we hold up things in our, in our side ourselves for way too long and then it becomes explosive? I'm not looking at my wife pointing her out, okay? But sometimes we get mad and we hold things up inside way too long. And I heard somebody on the radio and I sure wish that I could give credit for it. I can't remember if it was uh, Tony Evans or somebody, but it was one of those uh, guys that I heard on the radio going down the road. And it hit me so hard, I had to pull over on the side of the road to sink it in. Because when we have unforgiveness in our life, we have the absence of peace. When unforgiveness dwells within your life, in your heart, peace makes an exit out of your life. And then all of a sudden, you start having all of these problems, and you're mad all the time. And the question was, is why do Christians deal with unforgiveness in their life and why do they decide to just deal with it? Because it's easier to live in unforgiveness than it is to deal with conflict resolution. How many of you know nobody wants to sit down and talk about problems? God, Randy mentioned it earlier about our government right now. We got a, a new speaker of the house. We got new things going on. Now is the time in regardless of who's in office but we got problems in our country that need to get fixed. And as long as nobody is willing to sit down and talk, we're going to be in combative terms from here on out. How many of you have gotten some issues in your marriage? Don't raise your hands, because especially if your spouse is sitting beside you. But how many of you have ever sat there in your marriage and looked at that person that you're married to or that you're in a relationship wonder, and wonder, who are you and where did you come from? So we're going to be talking about some of these things. And I want to talk about learning to walk in forgiveness rather than unforgiveness. Because this unforgiveness is beginning to kill who the church is. The church is supposed to be the most forgiving place that you can ever imagine. How many of you know when a person walks in the door, regardless of whether they're a drug addict, whether they're a prostitute, whether they are a murderer, they should be uh, accepted for as a creation by God. Does it mean that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing? Absolutely not. But forgiveness is the one thing that we need to learn to walk in. So before we get started tonight, I'm going to ask you this question. Don't raise your hands, but I want you to ask yourself, do you have any unforgiveness in your heart before we start this message? If you do, please do not leave here tonight with that unforgiveness in your heart because it's stopping you from achieving what God wants of you. And God is speaking to some of you right now about getting something done. How many of you ever drug your feet about doing something that God's asked you to do? Anybody? Or am I the only person? There's been a lot of times where God speaks to you and you're just like, well, I'll get around to it. How many of you know that's a lie? Delayed obedience is still disobedience. So if you would, turn to that book that you never turn to called the book of Jonah. Please. Jonah chapter 4. We all know the story. Jonah is a prophet of God. There's a place called Nineveh. Uh, they are a pretty rough place. Matter of fact, they used to worship 
um, uh, gods of the sea, of the ocean. Uh, matter of fact, they were a fishing type community, but uh, they dealt with slavery. They were abusive. They tortured people. I mean, it was just a bad place to be. And God goes to Jonah and tells Jonah that he wants them to repent. And Jonah goes through the whole process. We know the process that he does. He gets told to God by God to go uh, preach to these people and bring them to a place of receiving the word. He decides he doesn't want to do it because there's such bad people. Have you ever known somebody in your life that you thought was such bad people that you just didn't want to share the grace of God with them? Boy, that's a bad thing when you're in that situation. So we're going to skip over. We know the fact that he ran away. We know that he had to get tossed over the boat. We know that he got swallowed by a whale. If any of y'all have watched Veggie Tales, you know the story. All of a sudden, you get through this process where he gets spit out on the land, and then all of a sudden, God says, okay, now it's time to go do what I told you to do. So eventually, Jonah says, okay, I got no other choice. So starting in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, it says in verses 1 in the New Living Translation, it said, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You were eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted uh, will not happen. Then the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? All right, so here's the thing is, God has told Jonah, I want you to go and tell these people that I love them. Yes, they are a knot-headed group of people. They are not friendly. They're not nice. But yet, I love them, and I want my grace to be upon them. He runs away and says, nope, I don't want them to receive your grace because they're just such evil people. Guys, do you know we see that happening in our government right now? Our country is so divided right now whether somebody is of a political party or not and you know what really bothers me is we need to start looking at people like they are worthy of God to you know, speak to them I believe that God wants to forgive absolutely every single person that will come to him but yet we have to bow ourselves to him so point number one it's none of our business who God wants to forgive how many of you know that sometimes we put ourselves up in a place of judgment we were never created to be a judge we were created to be a speaker so when God speaks to you it is none of your business who he wants to forgive or who he wants to bless I had a missionary one time that was preaching one time and I heard him say this said that um, vengeance is mine saith the Lord and boy, sometimes I sure do love doing the Lord's business. How many of you ever have seen somebody that got on your nerves and something didn't go right for them and all of a sudden they fell flat on their face or something happened and it's, it's hard not to snicker about it, amen? You think, well, they got their comeuppance. They got what they deserved. Let me ask you a question. Are you ready to receive what you deserve? Be careful because if it wasn't for the grace of God, you would have issues too, amen? So when we look at Jonah, we start seeing that God wanted Jonah to be a part of Nineveh's salvation, their repentance coming back to the Lord. I don't know about y'all, but I am so thankful that I had people working on me for a long time and trying to get me back into church. How many of you remember back when you were not in church, how many times did people walk up to you and say, hey, you want to go to church with us this weekend? Or brother, you need to go to church. Or sister? Uh, you might want to go find a church. Well, you'd sit there and you get so tired of it that you didn't want to hear it. And you shut off. And sometimes the greatest source of blessing that we can ever have, we shut it off from ourselves. Guys, let me tell you something. I don't know about y'all, but I'm a person that believes in blessing. But I'm also a person that believes in living outside of the blessing. How many of you ever been in a town and your wife had an umbrella? And it's raining. And then you let her walk out under the umbrella because if you both try to get up underneath there, both of you are going to be outside of it, right? 
So when we go into town, Kay's got the umbrella. I just say, baby, you go ahead and go on up there. I'll just walk in the rain. I'll be good. And, you know, to be honest with you, I sit there and I'm watching her walk in there and she's high and dry and I'm sitting there dripping. Got water going down my back and it seems, stupid umbrella. Why ain't I got one? Well, guys, what I want you to understand, sometimes because you see somebody else living a better life than you, doesn't mean that we need to get judgmental toward them. Or if they're doing something that we're not doing, Guys, there's people up here in the community that are doing some good things and some bad things. You don't have to look far to find it. Guys, how many of you have seen homeless people up here in town? Guys, let me, I'm going to tell you as a person that came out of a homeless lifestyle, don't laugh at somebody because they sleep on a park bench. God created that person too. When you see a drug addict, how many of you know drug addicts can get on your nerves? And especially when they're related to you. But don't get judgmental about them because God is going to do some things with them. But it's our job to keep praying for them, not to be judgmental with them. In Exodus 33, verses 19, it's the second part of the scripture. God tells us that he will have mercy on those that he has mercy and he'll have compassion on those that he has compassion on. How many of you know it's his job to figure out who he wants to, to bless? It's your job to help them get there. How many of you have had somebody take you to the side and say, you're not living right, and you need to get yourself straightened up? Ron, did your mom ever tell you that? Did your daddy ever tell you that? Anybody over here? I don't know about y'all, but I remember my mama boxing my ears for me. How many of you know what that means? When your mama boxed your ears for you, that means she kind of got a little slappy upside your head. and She'd make sure that you knew she was not happy. And I remember one time my mama told me, she said, Bubby, you better get yourself right. You're not living right. And you know that pride inside of me is like, don't tell me how to live. Anybody of y'all ever said that to anybody? Don't tell me how to live. It ain't none of your business. Well, I hate to tell you, their business is sharing common sense with you. In today's world, we don't have much common sense. So right now, forgiveness and unforgiveness is the two things that we as a church don't operate in that well. Guys, I'm hearing churches all the time that are fighting with each other all the time about whose city block there is and what's going on. And we have black churches, we have white churches, we have all these different places and denominations. We have built up so much dividing walls within ourselves and we forgot about what's common to us all. And what's common to us all is Jesus Christ. And when we start realizing who is common and who we're supposed to be serving, then all of a sudden we need to start realizing we need to walk in grace. Because let me tell you something, there's some of our children that are walking around today only by the grace of God. There's sometimes we've wanted to slap some, we've wanted to choke them, we've wanted to kick them, we wanted to hurt them. But by the grace of God, you know that you don't do that. So let me ask you a question. How many of you ever had somebody in church that's ever offended you in church? How many of you ever had somebody that you thought was supposed to be a godly person and all of a sudden you saw them on a bad day and boy, they messed up your world. I saw a guy one time that was a preacher one time and I had a great respect for him and all of a sudden I caught him on a really bad day. I have never heard such language out of a preacher before. And I remember sitting there getting really judgmental. Well, that guy, he just needs to repent and I didn't realize what kind of day that he was having. I didn't know about it until about six weeks later. He told me what was going on in his life. And you know, if I would have been a better pastor, if I'd have been a better friend, I would have went to him at that point in time and said, Brother, what's going on? What's happening? Can we pray about it? But yet I walked around for about six months and I didn't have forgiveness toward him because I thought that he was just living life outside of what a pastor was called to do. But yet he was fighting inside things that we never understood. If you go back to Jonah in verses 5 through 11, it says, Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under, and he waited to see what would happen to the city. So he's already done went and preached. He's already done given the word. He's going outside the city just to see what's going to happen. How many of you know we pray for revival in our city all the time? Jonah just went and preached re revival. And now he's sitting up on top of a hilltop and he's overlooking to see what will happen. 
How many of you know if God tells you to do something, go do it? Don't question it. But it said that he sat outside the city and he made a shelter to sit under and he waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there and soon it spread its broad leaf over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm the next morning. At dawn, the worm came and ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away and the sun grew hot. God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and he wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Or exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, it is, is it right for you to be angry because this plant died? Do you know this is the second time that God said to ask Jonah, is it right for you to be upset? How many of you know that God sent him to go preach? That was the reward in itself. So many times we want something. We want a reward for being obedient. Guys, listen to me. You don't need a reward for being obedient. I don't know about y'all, but I grew up in a life where when Papa told me to do something, if I did it, he didn't slap me on the back and say, good job. He always expected you to do what you were supposed to do. And you didn't need to be congratulated. You didn't need to be given a trophy for doing what you were supposed to do. But now if you went over and above and beyond, then, that, then Papa would say, hey, come on, son, let's go buy an ice cream. How many of you like those kind of rewards? When you do something above and beyond, so all of a sudden we look and we see where Jonah has done went and preached, preached revival. Revival's coming into the city because they turned to the Lord, but yet he's sitting up there on top of the hill and he's hoping that they turned him down so that fire would come down on that city and consume that city. How many of you know that's a sickness or a hatred that we should not have in our hearts? And you know, to be honest with you, pastors and leaders and ministers, we're just as susceptible to that as anybody else. And if, we, if it's going to happen in the church, how many of you know it can happen in your home? Or are y'all with me tonight or are y'all just staring at me? Because man, there's some times you're wondering, is my spouse upset with me? Well, let me tell you something. If you have an inclination that somebody is mad at you, listen to me. It's so much better for you to go to that person saying, hey, do we have a problem? Can we sit down and talk? Is there anything that we can do to get past this? Have I offended you? Have I done something that I didn't even know about? Because if we do that, then all of a sudden, it takes all this tension away. And guys, I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of living in tension. I'm tired of walking on eggshells. How many of you know that's, when you're a 300 pound man, walking on eggshells is not a fun thing. So guys, what I wanna encourage you to do is tonight when we get ready to leave here, we're going to be finished here in a few minutes, believe it or not. But I want you to really do some soul searching and I want you to ask yourself, are you living in some unforgiveness in your life? Or do you know that somebody is mad at you for something? If you do, listen to me. If you don't go to your brother or your sister and take care of it, you're just as guilty as they are. We need to go take care of conflict in our life and get it rid of it because we don't need to dwell in that. And when we have conflict, when we have all that, the Bible says that if we're married, listen to me, if you have conflict with your spouse and it says your prayers are not heard, do you think it's just because with your spouse? No, it's with other people. If you are mad at somebody else, do you think that your prayers are going to be heard? We cannot live in conflict and being upset all the time. Because if we're upset in the church, and I'm not saying that we are here dwelling in it, and I'm talking about the church body. I'm talking about the body of Christ. We need to learn to walk in forgiveness, and we need to accept forgiveness as well. How many of you ever have done something against somebody and you've always had a hard time dealing with owning that or up to that? You know, you've done some things in your past, all of a sudden you're thinking, man, how do I get past that? Well, guys, the first thing that to do is to ask for forgiveness. When we ask for forgiveness, then all of a sudden you see that there's things that happen. If we don't have the right to question God's authority, let me ask you a question. Whose authority are we living with, ours or God's? So many times in our life, I sit there and I wonder, how many times have I forgot about what God wanted 
and I sought after what I wanted. I'm at a point in my life to where I really want to see. In verse 8, he says, Death is certainly better than living like this. How many of you know that when you're living in a place of unforgiveness, he's right. It's better that I didn't have to deal with that. It's better that you don't have to live with that. But when you're walking in unforgiveness, guess what? Your life is dead. Your life is not enjoyable. It's not pleasurable. It's not profitable. And so when it says, when God says in verse 9, says, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? How many of you know that God provides so many times for our life and we start wondering why are we upset when it's pulled away? How many of you have ever heard what, what God gives, he can take away? Amen? Do you agree with that? Church that we came from in Arlington, we had a couple. There was a song, um, what was the name of that song, Mom? Um, Lord gives and he takes away used to be a big song in church and we had this one couple that was so mad and so upset that every time the praise and worship team would sing that song they would stand for half of it but when they would say the Lord take away they would sit down and they would fold their arms and that was their silent protest Pastor Rob one of our associate pastors eventually took him off to the side and turned around and asked him said let me ask you what, are you, what you're doing right now are you making a protest against the praise and worship team because you're introducing conflict into the church and when you introduce conflict into the church, it spreads and it can cause problems? Sometimes you may not necessarily agree with something that a praise and worship leader may choose or you may not even agree with what the pastor or the Sunday school teacher or the ministry leader may teach or preach. But before you get mad, go back and look at it in scriptural in reference and see if it's real. How many of you know that we can make mistakes when we preach? How do I know that? If we open our mouth, we can make a mistake. I can promise you that I've said things up here from the pulpit that I had good intention of saying one thing and something else came out of my mouth. And then you wished you had a rubber band where you could pull it back. Rayford, has that ever happened to you before? No, you lie. I'm forgiving you now. So many times we have to look at each other and we have to say, hey, you know what? Sometimes they just made a mistake and it wasn't personal. But why do we always feel like everything is always personal when something happens? How many of you ever had kids and said, hey, uh, mom, dad, that teacher just don't like me? Anybody ever heard that before? How many of you ever said that before? I had a teacher named Mrs. Reed one time, and I thought that woman had it out for me. And Mrs. Reed pulled me off to the side and corrected me one time. And she is the one teacher that I still talk to even to this day. And because of what that woman said to me, it fixed my life and helped me become the person that I am today. Simply because she cared enough to speak the truth to me. How many of you know that we need somebody to speak truth to us, not necessarily sugarcoat things? And so when somebody comes and speaks truth to you, don't get offended. Don't get upset. Ask as if it's truthful. So when we look in verse 9, it says, When God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, and, and angry enough even to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Should I feel sorry for such a great city? Guys, what's the population of Nacogdoches? Anybody know? So let me ask you a question. So you're looking at, say, whether it's thirty to 45,000, you're looking at a city that's three to four times larger than Nacogdoches. Does God care about Nineveh because there was 120,000 people? Or does he care about right here where we're at, although we only have a couple of hundred? Let me tell you something. God loves the couple of hundred just as much as he does the 120,000. It's not the size of the city, but it's the people that live there that he was concerned about. God wants to pour out his spirit everywhere. Guys, we need to be praying for revival right now more than anything. And when we, we start looking for revival to come, it may not be pretty. Revival may cause you to have to come to God and ask for repentance 
in a certain area and whenever you look and see what God is going to deal with, it may be painful. Repentance is never easy. If God is willing to forgive, why aren't we? We have something that's called rights. You have a right to be mad. How many of you ever have gotten mad at somebody? All you got to do is go to a car lot and talk to a car salesman. You can get mad real quick. Go to the grocery store and you get your bill. And all of a sudden, what used to be $150 is now $300. So it's easy to get mad, but what do you do about it? Guys, there's some things you can't change, and there's some things that you can. But the one thing that stays constant is the, the king that we serve, the one who sits on the most high. Guys, what I'm asking you to do tonight is I want you to take in your Bibles, I want you to write this out, and I want you to study this over for this week. It's in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Now again, I'm in a New Living Translation, but whether you're in English or an ESV, uh, an NIV, or New King James or King James, the basic gist is still the same. But in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, it says, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. And the standard that you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't even see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eyes. Guys, if you want forgiveness, then you've got to walk in forgiveness. How many of you ever have heard the old saying, you want friends, you, you know, be friendly? If you want to be able to have a good thing, you better be willing to give a good thing. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes if we start looking about the problems that we have in our own life, uh, we were talking about it uh, this week during the men's uh, meeting on Monday night. And we were talking about how in the military that if you saw somebody's uniform with a string hanging down, that was against regulation and code. It was your job to go up there and talk to him and say, hey, you need to correct your uniform, but there was a thing that always said that before you correct somebody, you need to correct yourself. So, George, thank you. This message came out of that. How many of you know that before you correct somebody, you better make sure that you're walking as God desires you to walk? How many of you know that's a hard thing to do? It's not easy to walk perfect, is it? Matter of fact, anybody ever accomplished that here? The only thing I'm perfect at is screwing up, okay? I can do that pretty well. But walking straight and walking right, I mess that up all the time. Guys, listen to me. If you want forgiveness, then you've also got to give it. So when we go back in and we study the scripture next week, I'm going to go ahead and let you go on that. We're going to pick back up there at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And we're also going to be talking about how to deal with conflict resolution next week. It's one of those things called the Matthew 18 principle. If you go back into Matthew 18, if you want to study that and you want to see how you handle conflict. Guys, this is not just conflict in life. This is conflict within your marriage, within your relationships, with your children, with coworkers. If it's a relationship, that is the design and the purpose of how you deal with conflict. So remember, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, and then you also go to Matthew 18. And then we will pick up from there and go out from there. So I'm going to give you an opportunity since we're a few minutes early. The altars are open. If you've got something that you want to come down to the altar about, you want to pray, you want to talk to God, you want to deal with some things, maybe you've got somebody in your life that's not in um, unity with you or maybe you're not in unity with them, the first place to do is to get right with God before you can get right with that person. So guys, I'm going to open up the altars. We're just going to let you come. Rex, do you want to come play just a little bit of music real quick? Would you bow your heads as we pray? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, as we talk about forgiveness, Lord, it's not enough for us to talk about it, but Lord, we need to do it. Lord, I ask that, Father, that you would go with us, and Father, wherever we're messing up in our lives, that, Father, that you would give us the strength, the wisdom, and the understanding how to correct it. 
Father, your word says how sweet it is when the brothers dwell in unity. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that, Father, that you would just pour out your spirit upon all churches here in Nacogdoches. That, Lord, we would be able to get together and, Father, we'd be able to fellowship for the advancement of the kingdom of God. That, Lord, our communities here would be blessed, our families would be blessed, and, Lord, that you would take the weight off of our shoulders. That, Lord, we would be able to see you move and do things. Lord, I ask that, Father, if there's anybody here that's walking in unforgiveness, Father, whether they're mad at a, a parent, a sibling, a spouse, a child, neighbor, or co-worker, Lord, we know the first place of healing to start would be in your presence. Lord, I know that sometimes when we go through times of divorces, Father, when people have taken things from us, stole from us, it's easy for us to get upset. But Lord, I ask that, Father, that you would teach us what it's like to walk in unforgiveness, to walk in peace. Father, to walk in accordance of what your will is. Lord, I pray that Father Nacogdoches, Father, would be a place where it would be demonstrated, where it says, may it be as in heaven or on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we just ask the Father that you would allow heaven to come invade Nacogdoches, that you would pour out your goodness and your mercy here. Father, we pray for restoration in our families, in our lives. Father, because we also know that can affect our health. Lord, I just pray that, Father, tonight, that, Father, for each person that's here, they would walk away and, Lord, know that if there is unforgiveness, that, Lord, they can give it to you. Let you deal with it. In Jesus' mighty name. All God's people said, as the altars are open, if you want to come, If not, please don't forget your kids. I promise you they don't want to take them home. Amen. We love you. In Jesus' name.